it's my uh, distinct pleasure to in introduce you. Some of you don't, he knows, for some of you, he needs no introduction. Uh, Dr. Gene Sealander has been a friend and mentor of mine for, boy, probably longer than either of us want to admit. And uh, he's, uh, um, every once in a while we get an opportunity to, to be blessed to have him open up God's word to us. So we're going to ask him to do that today. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to be back at First Baptist and to, uh, to open, uh, truly what Len says, to open up the Word of God with you today. is In reverence to God's Word this morning, not because we do this out of obligation or because it's, it's wise, but would you stand for the reading of the Word of God this morning? Coming from Luke chapter 2, verse 25 through verse 40. At that time, there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon. He was righteous and devout and was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. The Holy Spirit was upon him and had revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. That day the, the Spirit led him to the temple. So when Mary and Joseph came to present the baby Jesus to the Lord as the law required, Simeon was there. He took the child in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace as you have promised. I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all people. He is a light to reveal God to the nations, and he is glory to your people Israel. Jesus' parents were amazed at what had been said about him. Then Simeon blessed them, and he said to Mary, the baby's mother, This child is destined to cause many in Israel to fall and many others to rise. He has been sent as a sign from God, but many will oppose him. As a result, the deepest thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your very soul. Anna, a prophet who was also in the temple, she was the daughter of Phanuel, from whom the tribe of Asher. And she was very old. Her husband died when she had been married only seven years. Then she lived as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but stayed there day and night, worshiping God with fasting and prayer. She came along just as Simeon was talking with Mary and Joseph. And she began praising God. She talked about the child to everyone who had been waiting expectantly for God to rescue Jerusalem. When Jesus' parents had fulfilled all the requirements of the law of the Lord, they returned home to Nazareth in Galilee. There the child grew up, healthy and strong. He was filled with wisdom, and God's favor was upon him. That is the reading of the Word of God. You may be seated. You know, Christmas is a, is a great time, and it's, it's a lot of fun at our house, too. We got four grandkids now. Fifth one's coming January 23rd. We're all fired up about David... David James is coming. We've already, we've already picked out a name for him, David James. DJ, I can see that one coming. But anyway, our youngest right now is Jude. And Jude is, is, is well, all my kids are phenomenal, but this kid has got some kind of favor of God upon his life. He just says the most amazing thing. He's quite a thinker. We're bringing Jude home from preschool one day, and we're pulling into the garage, and Jude bursts out from the back seat in his, in his seat, and he says, he calls, actually, he doesn't call us Grandpa and Grandma. He calls Carol Nani, which should have been Nona, which is Italian for Grandma, but somehow it got to be Nani. And he knows that I'm bigger than his dad, so he doesn't go with Grandpa. He just calls me Big Dad. So we're Nani and Big Dad. So he's sitting in the back seat there, and Jude says, Nani, I'm really excited about what you're going to get me for Christmas. <laughs> now, you got to know my wife. She's a bit of a prophet, you know. So she says, well, well, Jude, it's not your birthday. It's Jesus' birthday. And we should be giving the presents to him. Well, this guy, you look back there, and he's like a deer in the headlight, you know. He's just like, he doesn't know what to say. And he thinks for about 30 seconds, which seems like about an eternity. And then he turns to Nani and he says, well, what about Big Dad? Does he give gifts? <laughs> He's not going to be, he's not going to be outdone, you know. <laughs> you know, a lot of us are like that, too. You know, we're, we're playing every angle, aren't we? We're playing every angle. I, I was struck by this story. Len asked me if I would like to pick out part of the theme of Christmas, and I was immediately drawn to the story of Anna and Simeon, two of my favorite characters. It was two of my mom's favorite characters in the reading of Luke chapter 2, which my dad made us sit down every every Christmas, and he would read Luke chapter 2, the whole thing. And Al and I, my brother, would sit there and we'd endure this reading, you know. 
Well, I'm doing the same thing today with my family. <laughs> Seems like a taste, doesn't it? But there was something about the story of Christmas that was just so powerful in every family. And the character of Anna and, Anna and Simeon were, were two that were just amazing to me. I mean, you know, you, you think about Simeon being a righteous fellow and, and, and being part of that. A, a little bit of Simeon's background. I, I just realized this. I didn't realize this, but Simeon was the son of Hillel, which one is, was one of the major rabbis along with Shema, that Jesus always said, you know, you've heard it said of old, but I say unto you, Jesus was talking about Hillel. And this is Simeon's dad, who was the president of the Sanhedrin Seminary. And Simeon becomes the heir to this later. He also has a son by the name of, of Gamil. If you remember in Scripture where, you know, when Jesus said, you know, in three days, I'm going to raise this temple up again, you know? He's talking about his own resurrection. Gamil doesn't understand that. And he mocks Jesus because he's a Pharisee. He's a totally unbeliever. You know, he's, he's not the first pastor's kid that went astray, I'm sure. But, you know, here is, right, sandwiched into history, is sneak in right in this little caveat is this guy named Simeon. Anna was an interesting character, too. She, she got married probably at the age of 17. That's most Jewish girls were married by then. And she loses her husband about age 24. Fast forward the tape now to 84. She's, she's been in the temple for 60 years. Every day, praying and fasting. Never even leaves the temple. I mean, not even to get takeout. You know, she's just there. I mean, the title of my message is, who does that? Who in the world waits for 60 years for the, for the restoration of a, what they believe in? I mean, could it be that Simeon and Anna talked to each other during that time? You see, Simeon was given a promise, according to this scripture we just read, that he would not die until he saw the Lord's Christ. Now, I know there was this separation of women and men, and they couldn't meet except in one part of the courts of the temple and all that stuff, but, I mean, 60 years, think about it. Simeon was a major player at the place. He probably had a conversation with Anna that, at least in my head, went around this way. How's it going, Anna? You know, the other day, I, 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 I kind of heard from the Lord. Yeah? What'd you hear? I'm not going to die until I see the Messiah. Really? You heard that? Yeah. Can you go figure? Wow. Well, can I get in on that? I think I could hang here for 60 years. I think I could wait. Could, could it be that possibly maybe Anna heard about Simeon's promise and that was good enough for her too? I don't know. Scripture doesn't say that. But it's an argument from silence, I suppose. I mean, this is kind of very unusual. Not only a woman by the, not only by this, but both of these people described as, in fact, Simeon was described as, as righteous. And, and I don't mean, you know, like he was righteous because the law made him righteous. The law told him the right thing to do, but the law could never make you righteous. Only the person of Christ can. But he was kind of religious righteous. Maybe a kind of a legalist with a good attitude. <laughs> he kept the law. He knew the definition between right and wrong. And it also says that he was devout, which means that he adhered to this. He was also patient. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. Now, the people of Israel suffered greatly, both from their own sin and because of the oppression of others. Their land was frequently overrun by foreign powers who knew the strategic significance of Palestine, which connected Africa, Europe, and Asia. In short, everybody wanted that piece of land. And so they were people who were in desperate need of consolation and comfort all the time. And that kind of comfort would come through the Messiah. Simeon knew that. And he knew that also that when the Messiah came, that peace would be permanent. No wonder they were looking for a reigning king, not a suffering servant. But Simeon had been promised he would see the Lord's, he would see the Lord's Christ. He also said, it also says in Scripture that he was assured. And that, that was certainty. He, 
he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Christ. You know, we have a tool that I'll show you right now if you want to put that up there, that's great. It's called Provision, Plan, and Promise. It measures certainty. When we do consulting work in the Denver area, both with profit and nonprofits, have you ever been around people who are kind of like maybe selling all the time? You know, they're always selling. <laughs> they want to do something. Sometimes we refer to them as salespeople. Sometimes we refer to them as control freaks. But they're always selling. Always selling. And, and it sounds like every time they're selling, they're making a promise. I, I have a, a, a person in our family who's always selling. And, and finally, I just have to, I have to stop and say, now, is that provision, or is that plan, or is that promise? Because I've heard this person in our family really talk about a great game and, 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 and everything, and it was really just possibility thinking or provisional thinking. But my children thought that she meant it was a promise. And so they went ahead, and after this said about coming out and using our place in California, they went ahead the next day and bought plane tickets, and she was just talking provision. But it sure sounded like she was making a promise. You see, when God speaks, he doesn't, he doesn't, you know, stumble. He doesn't mumble. He doesn't change his mind. If God's promise is something that you will see my Lord's Christ and you will not die, Simeon knew that wasn't just provision or a plan. He knew that was a solid promise. The two missionaries that we just prayed for right here just a second ago said they're going to go the six miles and more because God made a promise? I think she didn't say plan. I don't think she said provision. I think she said promise. I thought of my own life in the Christmas story and how many times I've just talked in provision. I've just talked in plan, but people took it as a promise. That's kind of a lack of integrity, isn't it, sometimes on our parts? when we do that. That's why Scripture says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. And I love it when Jesus got out of the grave. We'll celebrate that in a couple more months, right? A few more months. Because when God rose, God rose or raised Jesus from the dead, he was simply saying to the world, you see, my yes is my yes. What a, what a tremendous God we have. You know, you start understanding those are promises. That calibrates into my ability to wait. But a lot of us have a problem if God doesn't answer our prayer within a couple of weeks. A week. It's been five minutes, God. And we, we really want him to answer us in terms of maybe healing. Get a job. A relative come to Christ. Now, without a raise of hand, just you can raise your hand in your kind of silently in your in your in your heart. But how many of you have had a family member that you've been praying for for more than five years, ten years, twenty-five years, and just recently came to faith? Because something nudged you in your spirit that said, I, "I believe you believe that God was going to bring them." to salvation and to, to their faith in Christ. You see, when God makes a promise, he makes a promise. Now, I guarantee you, I, I understand, a lot, of us, a lot of us want to make sure that God is speaking. It's not just worth our own voice we're hearing. Because we do talk to ourselves during the day, don't we? We say, like, you know, we got to do something about that here. Uh, you know, I wonder if my presentation is going to be okay at work today. I wonder if that person really likes me. I mean, you know, all of these voices, this voice, we, we do have a lot of noise, head noise in our head. And sometimes we get it confused because we think maybe that was God talking to us. Or maybe it's the enemy that's talking to us. How do we really know God is talking to us? Because the scripture says, you're my sheep and they know my voice. Do you know God's voice? Because it's important that you do. I mean, you know, I mean, if you're a dad, you know, like, like I am, or, or you know, and you're, you're training up your kids, and, and you say something inadvertently like, yeah, God told me that, so shut up and sit down. Put your seatbelt on. Just relax. Uh, you know, really? 
that kid's going to trust you? It's an amazing thing in our life when you talk about two characters like Simeon and Anna. But they, they stood there with that promise, and Simeon had it, and in my head at least, after 60 years, I would have think that Simeon would have bumped into Anna somehow. But the question I have, and I, I don't know the answer to it yet today, but I wonder if Simeon told Anna and she had enough confidence in Simeon's life that if God had made that promise to Simeon, it might have been okay for her too because two different people with two different stories, but they both come out of the same thing because they were willing to wait. Anna waited through 60 years of faithfulness in that process. Well, she's been there for, we can imagine, somewhere around 60 years. And that information, those desires, that personal makeup, her convictions, kept her there the whole time. I mean, I don't know if it, during that seven years she had a son or daughter. The scripture doesn't say. She might have. Evidently, the writer Luke didn't think it was important to put it in the text, if she did. <clears throat> But what does she say to her kids while she's in the temple? Mom's going to be in the temple. Not going to see you anymore. I mean, who does that? Who waits like that? I think people who've heard God's voice and are willing to wait. This Christmas, I have to look at these two two people that are featured in our story today and I think that waiting patiently because they understand either through the faithfulness of my life as I just keep doing what God has asked me to do or if I've literally heard from God that when God makes a promise even verbally to me or he makes a promise by being faithful that he will reward that I'm willing to go with that There's nothing in the Christmas crash around town. You'll see the shepherds, you'll see the wise men, you'll see the sheep, and you'll see other things in that crash, but you won't see a figure of Anna or Simeon. But this year, in my head, I've added them into that crash. <laughs> These are two characters that I really would love to have in that crash. Because they represent people who are willing to wait and say that when God makes a promise, he doesn't stumble, he doesn't mumble, he doesn't stutter. It's true. Now, Simeon's in the temple. It's, it's amazing. First she throws in an amen when she sees Simeon back there. It's kind of interesting. I mean, she throws in... <laughs> He, he's got the baby in his arms, and, and by the way, he doesn't really even ask Mary or Joseph if he can hold the kid. Now, any mom who's a brand new mom, I, I've, been, I've, I've been a pastor for a long time, and, and, and you just don't grab a baby. At least most moms don't see that as a sign of real health, you know. And, and here she is holding her precious little child, and she knows he's special, and Simeon just barges right over and grabs that kid and picks him up. And, and, uh, and then gives this blessing. But at, at the end there, you remember in the text when I read it says, and a sword will pierce her heart as well. I can just see Mary's face. Can't you? When, she, when he drops that bomb on her, and she says to herself, at least in my head it goes this way, Joseph, I told you, we should have taken the side door. I mean, it's like, what are you doing here? I mean, it's like, did I have to hear that? But Simeon blesses this kid. That's amazing. I mean, there's no self-preservation. Do we have that tool up there? Can we show that one little slide there about self-preservation? Did we get that on the text there? Yeah. You know, here's, the, here's the kind of an interesting passage here. It talks about relationship with people and influence and impact on the other side but the reason that we never really have relationships with people 
we never really have influence with them is because we're worried about ourselves. We, we try to protect ourselves. Self-preservation could be like self-protection. And three questions come into bearing. What am I afraid of losing? What am I trying to hide? What am I trying to prove and to whom? Wouldn't it be really good if we could be people who didn't worry about those questions? We had nothing that we're afraid of losing, including our influence or our popularity. We're not trying to hide anything like our, you know, I'm just a little bit concerned about my, my self-image. I'll say whatever I need to say. That's what I love about my grandkids. They, some of them just have no filter. It's just like, <laughs> boom, it's right there. Not afraid of hiding anything. Sometimes there's that child, childhood innocence, and I, and I just think of Simeon. He didn't back off that prophecy. He didn't back off that blessing for one minute by saying, oh, yeah, and you too, Mary. You're going to feel the sword here too in your heart. You know, when I was a pastor, I would go around the staff, and I was privileged to serve some fairly large churches, so we had a large staff. And one of the questions I used to always ask before staff meeting ended, I'd say, hey, guys, before we leave this place, did I get your last 10% of what you wanted to say? And you know what? That's when the real staff meeting started. When I got their last 10%. Now the real agenda came out. But I wasn't afraid of losing anything. I wasn't really afraid of losing my, 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 my popularity. I wasn't worried about losing about any authority. I wasn't trying to hide anything. I wasn't trying to prove anything to anybody. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could live that way? how much we would be breaking down that barrier and we'd have relationships that really mattered? Well, Simeon and Anna had no self-preservation here that I can see. They just let it kind of all hang out. You know, and I find that so interesting that, and this is a phrase that I've learned to, to understand, especially in business with businessmen, that when, when power walks into a room, truth often leaves. When power walks into the room, truth often leaves the room. I've seen corporations where people, you know, talk about the boss, talk about the CEO, but the minute the CEO walks in the room, everything they just said just got quiet. And nobody tells the truth. Unfortunately, I've been with husbands who have trouble with talking about their marriage and their relationships with their wife. The wife walks in the room. I'm not going to talk about it now. My wife, who's a counselor and a therapist, says that even when she does couples counseling, it's just, it's either hard for the wife or the husband to talk about the real problems in the marriage because when power walks in the room, whoever is the most powerful, the truth often walks out. Not with Simeon and Anna. In Simeon's life, God walked into the room and told him. He never backed off that. He was faithful to the end. And I have to think that in my mind, too, that Simeon's son, Gamil, knew that when Jesus died and the sky darkened and the, the epithets were said at the bottom of the cross, truly this man was the Son of God, that those, those, the, that word just rang in Gamal's ears and said, oh no, Dad was right. Dad was right. And Grandpa was wrong. You see, when God makes a promise, we wait. We wait. We got total trust here. There's no problem. And I know that as they were doing these things, I'm sure there was undercurrent in the temple. You could just hear the people saying, oh, there they go again, that Anna and Simeon. Oh, yeah, there they go again. Those, those religious fanatics, those crazy fanatics. Claiming that they've heard voices, that they've heard from the Messiah. But for Anna, Anna and Simeon, reality was their friend. 
and their reality was always defined by God's promise. What's, what's your reality defined by today? Hopefully not Oprah, not Cosmopolitan Magazine, not your horoscope. I would hope that it's defined by what God says in his word that not one jot or tittle will ever disappear from this page. But it's true. And we sing with authority, on Christ the solid rock I stand. All everything else is sinking sand. You believe that today? Last week, Len preached on the wise men. And they were informed that the distance was short, but the journey would be costly. Two weeks ago, Pastor Len spoke about Joseph and unconditional obedience. That was the theme of what the nativity was all about. But today, the, the theme is that for those who wait, wait on what? For the fulfilling of God's promise. In anything that God has promised. Those are the ones who really win. Anna and Simeon were not worried about their age. Their age never surfaced once. <laughs> and as an old man myself, I'm very thankful for that. But they were only interested and focused on what still can be done. What still can be done. The world has never been kind to people who against, go against this worldly logic. You see on the screen there, is, there is no fanatic like a religious fanatic. That's what the world says. And if that's not bad enough, take a look at this next one. <laughs> a fanatic, either religious or political, is the subject of strong delusions. How about another one? In morals, what begins in fear usually ends in wickedness. In religion, what begins in fear usually ends in fanaticism. Fear either as a principle or motive, is the beginning of all evil. That's what people think about us. Many of us are called religious fanatics. Reinhold Niebuhr says this, the tendency to claim God as an ally for our partisan value and ends, ends is the source of all religious fanaticism. Really? Reinhold, you and I need to have a cup of coffee. We need to debate this a little bit here. But we're not concerned when we wait upon God. Let them say what they wish. This year, one of my family members, it's my son-in-law's stepsister's husband. You follow that? Okay, whatever. <laughs> Was inducted into the firefighters of South Suburban, South Metro. Wonderful kid. He's a two-tour Marine, Special Ops Forces guy. Unbelievable looking guy. He's massive. He's just, yeah, he's the kind of guy that you're like, you're glad he, 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 he fought for America. <laughs> you feel safer just knowing this guy. And he, uh, he's, he, was in, he was in the firefights and he took care of some people and he had a little slightly, a little case of that PDST or whatever it's called and but he's good now, and he's just became a firefighter for South Metro. Wonderful kid. But in that address, when we went and watched him graduate, the fire chief for South Metro said this. All of you are embarking on a 25-year career with us now. And for most of you, there'll be mandatory retirement after 25 years. And then he said this. Make sure that every day is your best day. That way, the last day of your career in South Metro will be your best. He said, that way we know we've succeeded. But if your first day on the job, which will be next Monday, is your best day, then we would have failed. I thought about that. And I thought about trusting God. I don't know what my last day is going to look like. My last day may be in a hospital with tubes coming out of every part of my body. 
and you say, Gene, that's your best day? Might be for my attitude. That, I still got that. And I'd like to think that at the funeral service, my son or my daughter or my wife, if she should succeed me, would say, you know what? The one thing we appreciate about our pops, my husband, was the fact right up to the moment he closed his eyes and went home to be with the Lord, that was his best day. He just kept trusting God and waiting. We so often, don't we? We complain and gripe and, oh, it's so tough and I'm just a hangnail on the body of Jesus. You know, and we're just so miserable. Really? I thought he made a promise. I, forgive me if I'm wrong, but I think he said, I came to give you life and to give it to you more. Yeah. I, I think that wasn't just provision or a plan. I think, I think that was a promise. One of my best friends in Denver is a fellow by the name of Vic Goulis who retired as a vice president of the world's largest company that cleans up toxic waste. Did a very important job in the world. Not just America, but the world. He's been in my Bible study for business leaders now for over 16 years, and he and I have become very, very good friends. And three weeks ago, he walked into that Bible study and he said, guys, I got some news. I just went to the doctor and my medical report wasn't so great. What's up? He paused, kind of choked back a few tears, and he said, I just found out I've got ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, and I've got two to five years left. We were just stunned. And looking across at one of my best friends in life, and I'm thinking, Here, here's what I said in my head. No, that's, that's not going to happen on my watch. Really? <laughs> it's not going to happen on my watch? No, I realized I was fighting for my friend. Wanting the very best. I mentioned this quote to him about a couple weeks after that. And the last time we met, Vic said to me, he said, you know, I want that last day of my life to be my best day. Because God said he would never leave me and he would never forsake me and that he came to give me an abundant life. Is that worth waiting for? Ann and Simeon evidently did. Ann and Simeon evidently did. Well, here we go, in conclusion. By the way, that was all in part of the introduction of my message. And Len knows that doesn't count on my total time. Okay. Here, <laughs> no, actually, we're just going to summarize these last three points very quickly. Three principles that I learned from Ann and Simeon. Number one, people who wait. Number one, their hope is in a promise, not in a plan or provision. We, know, we need to know that it's God's voice. It's not my own voice. It's not the, the voice of the enemy. Number two, their faith is in the fact that they have nothing to hide, lose, or prove. They're not worried about hiding their insecurity. They're not worried about losing their popularity or influence. And they're not trying to prove that Christianity is the only way. Now, I know I'm a preacher. But we've, we feel like we've got to prove it to people. You don't have to prove nothing. By the way, God doesn't need a lawyer. <laughs> he just needs a witness. Just tell people what you know. Share what your experience is. And then one of my greatest mentors of all time was Bill Bright when I served for 10 years on the Campus Crusade staff. He always says this. And he said it to me in Albuquerque one day and he put his arm around me and he said, Gene, just share Christ in the power of the Spirit and leave the results to God. Best advice I ever got. You don't have to prove it. Because his Spirit bears witness with others that these things are true. Just be a witness. And number three, people who wait, their love is in the fact that my last day on earth will be my best. Not the first day when I receive the promise of God. Isaiah chapter 40 is an interesting passage, is it not? And 
And I, I thought maybe we'd just kind of take a look at that for a second this morning. In verse 31 in chapter 40, it says, But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. In the uh, NLT, New Living Testament, it says trust when it says wait. In the NIV, it says hope. In the King James and the ESV, it says wait, those who wait on the Lord. The point is, those who are trusting in God, those whose confidence is high, that know it's a promise, not just a plan or provision, there are times that they will soar, they will rise up like they have wings of evil, eagles and just fly over the problem. I love that way. That's my favorite way to get over problems is to see them from 30,000 feet. <laughs> just fly right over that baby, no big deal. But sometimes it, we're, going to, we're going to run and not go weary. Sometimes we're going to have to go through the problem. But he says, as we go through the problem, God will give us the strength to get through it. And the final one, he says, and we will walk and not faint. Sometimes the war is not on the outside, the war is on the inside, isn't it? And he says, and that time, God will allow you to not just soar, not just run, but just walk and not pass out. Sometimes that's the way it is, isn't it? But what's allowing you to wait? The promise of God. The promise of God. This Christmas season, I don't know if you'll add Anna and Simeon to your crash that you have at the house or you see in the store, but maybe you could think of them being there. And the key element in their life is we waited. God fulfilled his promise. Either through just by being faithful or because of the spoken word in my heart. But both of us got to see the consolation of Israel and that it wasn't just temporary. It became permanent. And you and I now bask in that truth. May God give you the blessing this Christmas season with your family to know that it's worth waiting every minute for. So God bless you. May his face shine upon you. May he empower you to wait and allow his promise to penetrate your very life and your very heart. Amen and amen.